John Wycliffe translated the Bible into English. You see is these ribbons kind of start to spread out and then each ribbon will have a different language. That language is going to be represented by the statue and a plaque. These statues are actually dressed in attire that the people group would actually wear. Mm. You'll see that the, the plaque right in front has a, some information and you'll see this uh, mustard color. This mustard color is the country. So this would be Guatemala. So this mustard color is Guatemala. And then the language that we're gonna be covering with this specific one is Western Capital. Now, the national language of Guatemala is? Spanish. Spanish. In Guatemala and some of those uh, countries in South America, they have a lot of indigenous people. This is one of those indigenous languages called Western Capital. Mm. Now, even mm -hmm. within, the indigenous group, there are different dialects. It's gonna be Western Kachikel and it's John 316 in this language. Okay. John 316 in the Western dialect of the Kachikel language of Guatemala. Dios kasi lahira horu nakriyek or chuwach chin watch blip. In the Marie shoot that kapari yuk a horwa wet chuwach chin watch blip. Chia? Shashuk a hundruk a horko. Pero shoot that pa. One, when we translate, we translate for meaning. Meaning instead of just for having the, the exact word translated. Why? Because it can lose uh, the, the meaning to the people. Now we just learned that there's approximately about 7,000 languages. Out of those 7,000 languages, how many would you guess? still need just even a single word translated. Yeah, 5,000 maybe? I don't know. Ooh, okay, that's you know, a little lower than that, but you're, you're, you're getting there. We're gonna be going to Mexico, but we're not gonna speak, speak Spanish. <laughs> we're gonna speak a language called Cel Tau. And it's right here. Zel Ta. So we're gonna try to translate carry. You're gonna use these 26 words that are in that language, Zel Ta. And you're gonna try to translate these carry. Does that make sense? Translate carry with the context sandals using these 26 words with help. Our yeah. missionaries are showing up. A lot of times, they might not even know the language. Again, because we're translating for me, they move to the village. They don't just get to translating right away. They actually start to learn the culture because cultural context is very important to translating for me. And again, it's also in Mexico and it's called the Mazateco language of Mexico. Three words are like one word, but you pronounce it in three different ways, and now you said three different things. Listen closely to the following examples. Sit there, spin the top. Sit there, she pats tortillas. See there, he will spin the top. See there, she will pack tortillas. See there, I spin the top. See there, I will pack tortillas. See there, we will spin a top. See there, we will pack tortillas. How would you translate that in the Bible then? That, so, yeah. that's all that the is That is a, a good question, one. And two, that is the reason why our, our translators actually move. And now the way we do translation has evolved and changed to where we have the locals translate because again we're translating for meaning they're the ones that really understand their culture what we do is we go through a process where we have the local translate so that it means what 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 they wanted what the right meaning so it has the right meaning and then the other process would be then um our linguists will come into the picture to make sure that everything is accurate and then it goes through a a, a process of like a theology uh we have a group they study theology and we want we want scripture to still mean what God wants it to mean. We don't want to change it because we still want it to be God's word. Which is very unique because it also has a whistle language. 
Oh man. So you asked, how did we translate that? My question is, how did we translate it into whistle? Because we did that as well. It's Masateko whistle language. Man. What are you doing? I think you should be in the I am picking coffee. Cafe de la How much are you paying? Fourteen, my chili. Nothing. Big man. It's my own. It's our own yard. We actually recorded the whistle in the New Testament, and that's how they're able to like listen to it through that piece of technology. Okay. So it's not now. Our people, when they moved into this, you know, community, they realized. You know, they're really mean to each other. They don't really... So they were like digging and like asking questions. They found out that it's a revenge culture. So then they were trying to figure out how to translate scripture when forgiveness is such a big part of scripture if they don't even understand the concept of forgiveness. So in their digging, they actually found out that they have a way of saying, hey, we're even, but it doesn't translate to I forgive you. It just means we're even. And what that is, is let's say you come up to me and you do something to me. If I don't want to waste time and energy to do something back to you, what I'll do is I'll spit at your feet. And that's me saying, hey, we're even. So when it comes to translating God forgiven sins, what we had to say is God spit out your sins. And for them, the meaning clicked. And it's like, oh, so we're even with God because he spit out our sins. And then explaining that that can only happen through the cross, through Jesus Christ. Cameron, William Cameron Townsend. Now, William Cameron Townsend is the founder of Summer Institute of Linguistics and Wicked. So he started working for an organization that uh, they sold the Bible. And that's, they give this man Spanish Bibles to sell and they send them to Guatemala. Now he shows up to Guatemala, there he meets a man named Francisco Diaz. Now Francisco Diaz is a Spanish speaker, but as a second language. His first language is Cachiquel. So he's helping Francis, uh, he's helping Cameron, uh, Uncle Cam, trend, uh, sell these Bibles by translating for him. Until one day, Francisco realizes, you know what, like, my people don't have a Bible, they don't know God because there's no scripture for them. And he's bold enough to tell Uncle Cam, hey, would you be willing to translate the Bible into Kachikel so my people could know God, so my people could have scripture? And Uncle Cam, being a good Christian man, gives him an answer that I feel like all good Christian men would say. I'll pray about it, right? But you know, when you pray about something, you're going to hear God talk to you back. And so that thing happened to him where God told him, actually, I actually want you to translate that, that uh, into that language, the New Testament into that language. Now, he realizes, okay, I'm here with an organization that our goal is to sell the Bible, not translate it. So he calls and talks to, you know, his boss. And essentially what ends up happening is he loses his job. Because but he says, you know what, God called me to do this, and I believe by faith that He will provide. And I'm just going to be obedient to God. So in 1931, he finishes the New Testament. Now, it took him 10 years to translate the New Testament. What did he use as his technology? Note cards. Uh, so he would write words on note cards with a definition, words and definition. And then he would go word by word translating New Testament. What's amazing about this is that today with all the technology we have, it takes us anywhere from seven to 10 years to translate the New Testament regardless. Now, he did all that through the power of the Holy Spirit. And in 1931, he came out with that, that, that Bible. This is the first copy. That's how the Kachikel language got their New Testament. And that was the first time that we translated into any language. I'm gonna focus on this guy right here. His name is Nard Piguayo. Nard is from the Philippines. Now, 
I love this story because I believe that this story perfectly depicts why we do what we do at work. Because what happened to Nard is when he was eight years old, he lived in the Philippines, and he realized that, that man, like, there's a guy here that's new that I've never seen before. He definitely looks different. It was a, a missionary coming from the United States. As an eight-year-old, he's realizing, why is this guy here? We never get outsiders. So being a bold eight-year-old, he goes up to the guy. He's like, hey man, like, why are you here? And then the guy's like, well, I'm here to translate God's word into your language. And so what ended up happening is um, when the uh, book of Mark is what the book they started translating, um, Nard being eight years old, he would leave school and go straight to the guy and see what he was up to and would help him start translating. Until one day, you know, I don't know if you guys would ever allow your kids to do that. I don't recommend it. But one day he's like, you know what? I'm not going to go to school at all. There's no need for me to go to school. I want to stay here and translate this book. So he stopped going to school and he started translating. Now, after four years, they finally finished the book of Mark. That means that now at this point, Nard is 12 years old. And so something happens. The missionary needs to go on furlough because he doesn't have funds and he wants to see his family. So what he does is, since Nard was the one helping him, he gives the copy of the Book of Mark in his language for the first time. Nard has a copy of the Book of Mark in his language. Nard ended up getting saved, but without the help of a pastor, without the help of a missionary, it was just him and God's Word and the Holy Spirit ministered to him through that. But if he didn't have the word in his language, that, that would have never been possible. He would have never gotten saved. But because he had access to God's word in his language, he was able to be saved. And that's why we do what we do. We believe that if people are able to get, a, get their hands on God's word in their language, that's enough for the Holy Spirit to minister to them and bring them into salvation. This is uh, where we get into kind of like some of the work we've done and some of the work that still needs to get done. Now, let me ask you, which of these continents do you think has the most languages? So, number one is Asia with 2,411. All right. Number two is Africa with 2,193. These islands right here, you got Australia, Papua New Guinea, these other islands right here, New Zealand with 1,346. You come to the Americas with 1,100 languages. And last would be Europe. And again, people are always like, that has to be wrong. Why? Because Europe only has 311 languages. Information. Now remember, 1,100 languages in the America that we've completed, meaning Old Testament, New Testament, only 74. Portions, meaning either just New Testament or Old Testament, or even like specific verses, only 509. That means that we're still waiting to translate 517. They don't have a single word translated. We have Africa. Africa came in number two. So 272 completed. Portions, 821. Still waiting over 1,000 languages in Africa are still waiting just for one word to be translated. You look at Asia, 232 languages fully completed, Old Testament, New Testament. Portions, 726. Still waiting, over 1,400 languages in Asia are still waiting. Now, Europe only has 311 languages, but only 73 out of those 311 are completed, meaning Old Testament, New Testament. Portions, 121, and still waiting, 119. Yeah. Pacific, only 53 are completed. Portions, 534, which means 755 are still waiting on Scripture. Harvest is plentiful, meaning there's plenty of people that do want God's Word. But we don't have that many people willing to actually put their lives in danger for it. We don't have that many people willing to learn a new language just to help a, new, a, a people group have the Bible, you know? So we actually, when we get to this part, I always say, hey, like, if you're going to remember anything out of this store, don't let it be anything other than 
pray for us. Because the number one way that you can help is through prayer. We ask for prayer in two areas. Number one, if you remember Wycliffe as you're praying, ask God to protect our, our leaders, our missionaries, and to give them wisdom. And number two, that God would continue to provide the resources and people to be able to continue this work. We have a pretty big goal, and by 2025, we want to have at least one scripture translated in all languages. Gives you kind of a visual. In the yellow, you have the completed Bibles. In the red, the New Testament. In the blue, the, the portions. And then in the gray outline is the, the people representing the people that still need translation. Now, that means that out of the 7,000 languages, there's about over... Uh, close to 3,000 languages that have zero translation, not even a single word translated into it, into their language. So.